David um, is, has been the Director of Research Projects at the University of Reading Library since 1982. Um, and if you look at his page, you can see there is a daunting array, an exciting array of different interests and, and roles that, um, a very varied selection of roles that David has occupied. Um, most people probably know him as the editor of the Location Register of the 20th Century English Literary Manuscripts and Letters and also the, uni the UK editor of the Watch Copyright Project. Um, he's been awarded all sorts of medals, including the Be Benson Medal of the Royal Society of Literature for Distinguished um, Services to Literature, um, and he's an active member of the International Council of Archives, the ICA. In particular, um, he's the chair of the ICA's section for archives, of literature and art, and the ICA's working group on intellectual property. Um, and it is that interest there, I'm sure he'll talk to us more, that has led him also to become the principal investigator of the Diasporic Literary Archives uh, project, uh, Leverhulme International Network, and it's in that capacity that I have been able to work with David, um, and he'll be talking about that project today. But he's also um, a respected food historian. He's published a book recently, I think it's come out in September, is it David? Yes. On the history of figs, the global history <laughs> of figs. He's also published on Bacalao, um, and he's also involved in local politics. He's been uh, the le leader of Reading Council and the chair of the board of Reading Buses. Um, so without further ado, I'll now hand over to David. Um, so thank you very much. Literary archives are often scattered in diverse locations without any sense of appropriateness or spirit of place. Whilst they're sometimes donated or deposited, they're often sold. And competition between collecting institutions at auction has been another strong and many would say regrettable characteristic of the world of literary manuscripts over the past 50 years. Last year at uh, a literary manuscripts workshop in Pavia in Italy, I heard Michael Forstrom of the Beinecke Library give a very complete description of all the ways in which uh, literary papers could be uh, split. He found no fewer than 14 different forms of splitting, split between different collecting repositories, split between the fonds and what survived, and so on, right through to split between paper collections and Born Digital, a modern form of collection splitting. Split collections seem to be an essential part of the world of literary manuscripts. We're starting to see a small number of digitisation projects which bring split collections back together again, such as the online Shelley Godwin archive, but these remain rare and special, usually well-funded cases. Many archival collections are deposited, usually by organisations, in their normal archival repository as a matter of course. The great majority of collections, certainly by shelf mileage, find their homes in this way. The principal exception is provided by personal papers, and the most volatile and unpredictable type within that principal exception comprises literary papers. Literary papers, when they're the right papers at the right time, can have an extraordinary financial value. A single love letter by one of the great English Romantic poets will easily go past uh, £100,000 at auction. The greatest collections, like those of the succession of publishers, all called John Murray, can be valued in the tens of millions. The market in literary manuscripts follows fashion to a very considerable extent, and it's part of the skill of the new generation of literary archivists to anticipate fashion and make early acquisitions. Acquiring the papers of out-of-favour authors can significantly enhance a literary archivist's reputation if the author returns to popular or curricular esteem. In cases where the reputation is clear and the papers have a clear and well-understood value, then the richest institutions will normally prevail. In very few countries, however, is the market permitted to follow its own financial course. Most European countries have some form of state involvement in heritage sales, whether through export licences, requirements to give first refusal within the country, or various forms of incentives. Some countries have favourable tax regimes for donation or bequest, 
And other original incentives to donate have been devised. In Spain, for example, donation of the whole Nachlas to a recognised foundation can be rewarded with the extension of copyright duration, which is why Federico Garcia Lorca, who was killed in 1936, remains in copyright in Spain. In funding the Diasporic Literary Archives Network for three years, the Leverhulme Trust has wonderfully given us a primary remit, which is to network, to talk to each other, to compare experiences and to share best practice. This has been one example among many of the growing pr propensity of literary archivists to work together and to synergize their activities. Just to give a sense of the range of the new network, I'll tell you the themes of the, of the five workshops that it's organized during the period 2012 to 2014. So the first workshop held in this very room was called Questions Informing Scattered Legacies, an introduction to the idea of diasporic literary manuscripts. The second workshop in Pavia in uh, March 2013 examined the whole issue of split collections, which I've referred to for you. The third workshop held in Caen talked about the stakes of public-private ownership and included reference to the ways in which literary manuscripts are represented in business, publishing and other non-literary collections, another form of diaspora. The fourth workshop was held in Trinidad earlier this year and was entitled The Politics of Location. It was a workshop on the sensitive issues of acquisition, including the loss by less wealthy countries of their literary heritage. And the fifth workshop was entitled Diaspora and Possibilities for Digitization, held at the Beinecke uh, Library in Yale last month. This was a meeting which covered some of the exciting new initiatives which are opening up in respect of born digital and digitized archives, which I'll talk about later, especially in richer countries, which also explored some of the more sensitive areas of poorer countries, not only as regards technological problems, but also issues relating to equalities, human rights, and the politics of purchasing power. One aspect of the diaspora which has become clear during the work of the network, and on which I first wrote after the archive of José Saramago found a home in Lisbon, is that there are really only four countries in the world which regularly and systematically collect the papers of non-nationals, namely the USA, the UK, Canada and France. As the network members saw in visits to Pavia and Venice, there's a striking contrast with literary archival activity in Italy, where they've been diligently collecting their own literary papers since Petrarch, nearly 700 years ago, but have no mandate to collect the papers of non-nationals. Although, of course, authors from other countries do find their way into Italian archival collections. So I've tried to reflect on what the four-country model means for some of the papers of some of the greatest writers, by common consent perhaps, of the uh, 20th century. It includes people like Margaret Atwood, Samuel Beckett, Carlos Fuentes, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, Alfreda Jelinek, Doris Lessing, Nagy Mahfouz, and Orhan Pamuk. And that personal list provides some interesting stories and some telling controversies from the world of modern literary manuscripts. I mentioned already the controversy that was caused in Mexico, front page outrage, by the purchase of the Carlos Fuentes papers by Princeton. Similarly, the proposed Sotheby's uh, sale of Nagy Makfouz's papers in December 2011 caused controversy in Egypt and the sale was abandoned. We now understand that at least some of the family may want those papers to stay in Cairo, perhaps at the American University. Meanwhile, the archive of Margaret Atwood is arriving in regular installments at the University of Toronto and Elfrida Jelinek has a similar arrangement with the University of Vienna. Beckett's papers, as we've seen, are split between Reading, Austin and Dublin, among other places. Similarly, the papers of Doris Lessing are split between the universities of Texas, Tulsa and East Anglia. But given that there's almost no interest in Turkish language and literature in the big four collecting countries, there's every chance that the Orhan Pamuk archive will stay in Istanbul where it so obviously belongs, and it could be said that Pamuk is to Istanbul, what Saramago is to Lisbon, and Mahfouz to Cairo. With a self-referential appropriateness, in 2012 Pamuk himself established a museum in Istanbul displaying his own novel, The Museum of Innocence. The conclusion to this discussion 
is that in an international context, the language used by an author is a major factor in the eventual, eventual destination of his or her literary archive. One very positive example of this, which the network has considered in some detail, is the literary manuscripts of Brazil, which uh, present a fine example of a country establishing wonderful collections of its own literary heritage. As we look to the future, and as the Diasporic Literary Archives Network draws towards its close, we expect some of the major themes that the network has discussed to be continued either as academic research projects or indeed as pieces of in works of international solidarity. So some of the, the things that we've already worked on in the past three years and which we expect to continue into the future include these. Firstly, work on archives at risk, which uh, involve drawing up new protocols for collaboration on endangered literary collections worldwide, especially in poorer countries. And we hope that people from Reading will be participating in a meeting uh, called early next year under the auspices of UNESCO. Secondly, a project on the dispersal of literary archives through publishing and business archives. Then, protocols for collaboration between institutions which hold split collections. Then again, the idea of mapping split collections, a cartographic approach to literary manuscripts worldwide. Another project could be best practice and digital solutions within the diaspora of digital literary archives. Some more specific things that we've worked on include the literary archives of Namibia, a case study and model where we've tried positively to help uh, archivists in Namibia to work more effectively on collecting the rich literary heritage of that country, and similarly Caribbean literary archives in Caribbean institutions, a new future there. Another project relates to hidden archives, which are uncatalogued archival troves. We had a fine example from the uh, University of the West Indies in Jamaica, which surprisingly has an uncatalogued Derek Walcott archive, the San Lucian uh, uh, author and Nobel Prize winner. We intend to create a guidance document for authors who are considering placing their papers in an archival institution as a joint project with the Society of Authors and GLAM. We intend to continue to work on the locations of literary collections, divided literary collections worldwide, providing a sort of international uh, location register, which already exists on the Diasporic Literary Archives website. And we intend to continue to survey the way that literary manuscripts divide up and are spread throughout the world, continuing to spread information um, about the, uh, the diaspora. So this is an exciting and diverse range of ongoing and future projects, which will in some form or another, not yet funded, uh, keep the Diasporic Literary Archives Network active long, before it's long beyond its official finish. And I hope that a good number of them will be adopted by other funders uh, or consortia. If not, some or other of them will undoubtedly be picked up within this university and by the International Council on Archives and its section on archives of literature and art. To conclude, I'd like to bring together some thoughts about 21st century literary manuscripts, both those created in the early years of the new century and those still to be created. <coughs> Many of the letters, emails and manuscripts which have recently been added to the British Location Register themselves date from the 21st century. And this reflects a major shift in attitude by British literary archivists towards collecting modern papers. When the Location Register project began in 1982, there were still vestiges of some old and entrenched attitudes. Uh, above all, there was a belief that authors' papers should not be collected until they were safely dead and their reputations established. Now, literary archivists are happy to collect papers which were created only months earlier, even though this brings with it difficult issues of data protection and privacy. So the nature of literary manuscripts is changing, as most authors use computers for at least part of their work, but for the first decade of the new century, the majority still appear to be on paper. The computer printout with handwritten annotation is perhaps the most typical form of manuscript for the period 1990 to 2010. Archivists expect this to change and are ready to receive more and more manuscripts in the form of memory sticks, hard disks, and other electronic media. But so far, 
This is happening probably less than would have been predicted 10 years ago. Colleagues confirm that archivists are still unsure about how to come to terms with the prospect of acquiring significant numbers of digital archives, and that some recent acquisitions are in fact partly experimental in purpose. In other words, archivists are acquiring a few digital archives partly in order to test themselves and their readers and their cataloguers. Archivists have very little confidence that for digital collections, the model entitled, if we build it, they will come, <coughs> will work. And they report that it's not yet clear just how much scholars are using available digital collections. In 2014, the status and nature of literary manuscripts 10 years hence, at least in the richer countries of the world, is probably more uncertain than for any 10-year period since 1700. And the longer term future, similarly, more difficult to predict. Very few specialists doubt that literary manuscripts do have a fascinating and exciting future, but even fewer are prepared to forecast between 2015 and 2025 exactly what form that future will take. <laughs>